Welcome back. My name is Jason Shapiro. I'm a Java instructor here at Intertech, and this is the second part of the introduction to the Google Web Toolkit. Now, in the first part, we were talking about AJAX, what it takes to write an AJAX application by hand, and what are some of the challenges uh, in writing AJAX. And that leads very nicely into describing what GWT will provide for us. So let's start with an overview. GWT, the Google Web Toolkit, is used to create AJAX widgets and web applications. One of the main differences between using GWT and writing an AJAX application on your own is that we will be writing in Java as opposed to JavaScript. Now, there is a way to insert native JavaScript into your Java application if you need to. That's known as JSNI, JavaScript Native Interface. And that's an advanced topic that I'll point you to some more information about uh, in a future part of this presentation. But we primarily write our applications in Java. And we use an XML configuration file to generate all of the JavaScript uh, files that we'll need for our application. So let's take a look at what that means. So let's say we want to write a web application and we've internationalized our application. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the process of internationalizing an application, I will be demonstrating that briefly in part three of this presentation. But let's say we've done that and we want to support English, French, German, and Spanish. And we also have four different types of browsers that we want to support, Mozilla, IE, Safari, and Opera. Now the typical way that I would do this is I would have to either start branching my code or actually have completely different files that I would write and maintain for the different browsers. This is because in, in some places uh, the JavaScript will vary. I won't be able to use the same event handling JavaScript uh, objects and methods as I would in IE um, compared to say Mozilla or Safari. So there are areas where we have to start branching our code. With GWT, I can get away from that. I can say, okay, here's the widget I want to use. Let's say some sort of a, a table that's dynamic. I'm able to add rows and remove rows. So I write this widget, and when I do so, I don't really have to think about the browsers. I don't have to worry about how is this going to behave in Mozilla versus IE. This is not something I have to worry about. Instead, I write the one code, one bit of code, and then in the configuration file, I make sure that I... Um, specify that I want to be able to support multiple browsers. And this is actually one of the basic things that GWT does right out of the box. Uh, when we take a look at the configuration file, you'll see that uh, one of the elements uh, inherits a bunch of behavior for us, and some of that behavior includes supporting multiple browsers. So, jumping back, I write uh, the widget that I want to write. I don't think about the browsers. And then when I compile this, it will actually generate all of the variations that it's able to determine from that configuration file. So one bit of code, but in this case, 16 different versions will be uh, compiled and generated into JavaScript. So when a request comes in for uh, an Internet Explorer browser and it wants the French version of our application, it will get the French version for Internet Explorer. Again, I have one code base, but all these multiple variations are generated for me. So I think that shows a real obvious benefit to GWT, but what are some of the other benefits? Well, the code is written in Java, and so what that means is we're going to get all of the benefits that we get when we write in Java. It's a strongly typed language. We'll have compile time checking. We'll also have the ability to code test and debug in fully featured IDEs. Also, as I just showed you with that matrix of different uh, generated variations, we are able to write our code with fewer, need, uh, fewer needs to actually branch that code on our own. So we write one code base, we generate multiple variations from that single code base, that way, if, like, say, um, browsers are updated over time, maybe there's new AJAX libraries with better optimizations, theoretically, I should be able to take that single code base that I'd written without having to modify the code at all, maybe just getting a, a new jar from GWT, I should be able to recompile that existing code and generate the updated JavaScripts, again, without having to actually modify any of my code. 
Now the JavaScript that's generated is optimized for the specific browsers, so it should behave and run um, probably better than what I would write on my own. And also, once these JavaScript files are generated, they are, they are created in a way without having large if-else blocks to handle all the multiple clients. Um, so that's going to, of course, improve um, the traffic uh, to the client. So let's say that I do want to make a change to my code. Now, previously, if I wasn't using GWT, I would have to find the area of code that I want to change, and then I'd have to find all of the different variances that I've created and make the changes there too. So if I had a JavaScript file for IE and a JavaScript file for Firefox and a JavaScript file for Safari, then I'd have to go in all three of those places and make the change that I want to implement. With GWT, since we have one code base that gets generated, into multiple JavaScript files, I should be able to only go, I should be able to go to just a single place, change the uh, widget or the functionality that I want, and then regenerate. Uh, so that makes maintenance a lot easier. In addition, GWT has um, a lot of out of the box widgets uh, RPC support, remote procedural call, and support for internationalization, JUnit, and other things. So to install GWT is a pretty simple matter. First of all, you'll want to get to the website. You can find that right at the Google search engine just by typing in GWT. One of the first, if not the first, result that should come back is the Google Web Toolkit from Google Code. If I click on that, and of course make sure you're at the real google.com domain, um, you'll see that there is a download button here, Download Google Web Toolkit. Click on that. And the default is for Windows. Right now they're at version 1.5. And if I was to click on that, I would get a zip file. If you need to download for other platforms, there is a link right here, download for other platforms. If I click on that, you'll see that there are different builds for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So once I have, in this case, a zip file for Windows, uh, then what I can do is just install it. I install it into my uh, C drive under GWT-Windows-1.5.3. You can uh, download it basically anywhere you want. There's really no setup to run. You just unzip the archive and you're ready to go. Now although there isn't a setup file that you need to run, the other thing that you'll want to do is set up two environment variables. And the way that you'll do that depends on your operating system. I'm just showing you here using uh, Windows XP. Um, there is a dialog in the system properties that will allow me to set up environment variables. The two environment variables I want to set up, regardless of the system I'm on, is one called GWT underscore home. And I just want the value of that to be the directory that I unzipped the GWT distribution into. The other item that I'll want to add is with path. And if I open this, you'll see at the very end there that I included that same directory in my path. That way I can run any of the executables without having to be inside or specify that directory specifically. Let's take a look at some of the files that are contained inside of the GW.